Hey guys, so I'm sitting here with my good friend, Lauren Widrick. Widrick, sorry, my bad. We've known each other for, I don't know, 18 or 19 years now. Um, I'm gonna let you kind of introduce yourself, let us know what you do, um, and we'll kind of go from there. Have we known each other for 18 years? Um, we went to college together. I, actually, we didn't. We met right after yeah, college. So right. I moved down here and had a random roommate, and she was like, I have all these great guy friends. They also went to OU, where we went to school, and we went to one party at your place, and we've just been friends ever since, but it's been wild watching each of our journeys because you've started all these businesses and I'm sitting here in the lone pronto offices that are gorgeous and full of a huge team and you're in nine markets now. So it's just amazing to be sitting here like this all these years later. I know I feel like you went through kind of a crazy journey yourself. Yeah. Tell us about that journey. Okay. So when I met Roger in 2005, I came right out of school to work in banking, investment banking actually. So I worked at Wachovia Bank, which became Wells Fargo. I did that for 13 years growing up in information technology for the investment bank. So very impressive on paper. Moved up quickly. I was managing a team of 60 people on three continents by the time I was 29. All good. Until I had this kind of like life mental breakdown of this isn't what I'm meant to be doing. So in my coaching now, I'll get to this. I'm a life coach. I host personal development events and such. There's this moment in time that a lot of people have that's called the millennial life crisis. So somewhere between the age of like 35 and 45 where you're like, what am I doing? What am I doing with my life? This is a good on paper job. I'm making plenty of money. I have the house. I have maybe a partner or kids, but like this ain't it. And so I had that breakdown and lost my mind. Like I went into a little bit of like an alcohol spiral. My marriage was on the rocks. Like it was bad. And then I stumbled across this woman who I think we both know named Sarah, Sarah Olin. Uh -huh. I worked with her. Yeah, yeah. me too. She changed right. my life. So at the time, my husband introduced me to her, and he was like, you're, you're, you're going through some shit. Like, you need to talk to somebody. And I met this woman named Sarah. So I met with her, and I was so skeptical because I'm like, life coach. That term just sounds kind of fake. It kind of, sounds kind of silly to me almost. It's a stigma. As a stigma. Sure. Right, either that the profession is fake or that people who need a life coach are losers or something. But anyway, I was so lost that I met with her, and she asked me one simple question. Maybe she asked you this too. What do you want out of life? And I'd never stopped to ask myself that because from high school, you're figuring out which college to get into. And then in college, you figure out where you're going to get your job. Then you're in your job and you figure out how you're going to get promoted and get the next job and the next job. And you never stop to say, like, what do I actually want? And so what came out of my mouth was, I would love to do what you do, but I don't feel like it's a real job. You know what I mean? Like, I'm used to being in this fraternity of the Charlotte banking scene. That's my identity. You know, this young, rising female tech, whatever. And she's like, Bitch, it's a real job. <laughs> she was like, I do it. You know, she's very successful at it, even more so now than when we first met her. And so I was like, fine, let's go. So I disrupted my life. I decided to sign up for that coach training program. I flew to New York City for a year, started that business, and then side hustled my way out of banking. And I've been doing this full time, life coaching, um, doing corporate coaching, executive coaching, running personal development events and courses ever since then, since 2018, full time. Crazy. My, my story is similar too, because I met Sarah, I found her on Charlotte Agenda, it was Agenda, and I met with her the first time, and I was going through a similar crisis where I was, I knew I wanted to get out of the job I was in, I was in a different company, and she asked me a similar question, she's like, well, when are you gonna quit? Mm -hmm. I was like, I don't know, maybe like a month or two months, and she said, no, you're gonna quit tomorrow. And literally the next day, it was like August 15th of 17, I walked in, I told my business partner I was, I was leaving the company. I incorporated this company a day later. So it's funny how, wow, funny how like a life coach, I call it a life coach, you can call it a business coach or whatever you want, but um, they make you do bold things that you wouldn't otherwise do. I think that's where the power comes into play. Yeah, for, for sure. Um, so I, I think I have this question, maybe answer, but what was the specific event that made you make that change? Like you obviously sought out a life coach, but was there something that happened at work or personally, or was it a combo of, com uh, bunch of different things that led you that that path or what happened yeah so for the sake of brevity i left out an important detail of that story which was getting fired from my dream job so i worked in investment banking that entire time but i took a risk in 2013 i believe uh and went to work for a tech startup not technically a tech startup but a small tech company and they gave me a big job i was um a divisional director over five departments and i loved this job but 18 months later i was unceremoniously fired from that dream job and that jacked me up as an A performer. You know, all that success I'd had in investment banking didn't translate into this world. And the harder I worked, the more frustrated they were with me. 
And so that's when the breakdown is really happening. I'm working 10 hours a day, now 12, now 14. I'm never coming home. Then when I do, I'm drinking my face off because I'm so frustrated. My two-year-old daughter is getting like no attention. My husband is saying, what is this all about? It's just a job. Just get a new job. And I'm like, no, I've never failed on this level. Yeah. Yeah. I've never failed. It was so humbling and it really jacked me up. So I went back to the, I got fired. Went back to the bank, got paid more than I'd ever been paid before mm -hmm. and was more miserable than I'd ever been. Yeah. And so again, my, my husband, who's super supportive, was just so like confused. He's like, you're, you're back. You're fine. You're getting paid well. Like that company, they were a bunch of assholes anyway. Like who cares? And I did. I never really failed that hard before. And so it was right after that time that I finally talked to Sarah. Okay, and here we are. Um, Move on a little bit here. So your focus is on primarily on women. Is that my, am I hearing that right? I mean, your squad is women. You know, that's, it tends that, to be. Yeah. Not necessarily. The that or is it just the route that you kind of went in and beginning just to simplify what you're doing and create a path? Yeah, I'm definitely not like a coach for women. I've coached men. In fact, the first couple of years I was coaching almost exclusively men. Gotcha. Because that was my, my network. So I was still working in investment banking. I started this thing. So it was all dudes. It's mostly women now, I think by nature of my marketing. I think the pain points that I talk about are like, this struggle is real, yeah. right? Like you're working a full-time job, you're a mom, you've got the mental load, you feel lost. Like I think women are attracted to the way I speak about it, but it does catch a few enlightened men too. And they're like, whatever Kool-Aid you're drinking, I want. So let's talk about the way you speak. So you cuss a lot and I cuss a lot too. Yes. And I wrote a couple of <laughs> words just from your website. I, I went through some of your, um, I looked at your, your, your speech you did or your thing you did at uh, Charlotte Morning. What's it called? The Morning? Uh, oh, Creative, Creative Mornings. Mornings. So there's no words. Yeah, unfuckable, badass, cock blocking your dreams, grab life by the goals, um, <laughs> lift, the F, lift the F up, goalgasm. Um, I do that's a lot of branding and I'm, I'm big into branding as well, but I, I think it's catchy and, you know, my, my marketing team noticed as well, but, but why? Like, well, what's it do for you? Um, you know, why the swear it so much? How's it working? <laughs> I like it and it feels good. Yeah, yeah. For real. I, I've had a couple of friends who have said to me, like in confidence, they're like, Laura, you're a smart, you know, successful person. You don't have to stoop down to that level of using those words. And I will look them straight in the eye and be like, I'm not stupid to any level. This is how I talk. Yeah. Like Roger and I, before we hit record on this podcast, we're dropping F-bombs. We're just being our old selves, right? Like I don't want to put on a fake front. It's why I left my old life. Honestly, when I was in investment banking, I had to fit into their box, you know, perform properly, check the boxes on my performance review, not step out of line. And when I first became a coach, I was kind of putting on that persona as well. So I branded myself as executive coach in those first few years, which sounds fancier and nicer. I would put on a business suit and like nude heels and I would go into companies like Duke Energy and JLL and Bearings and like pretend to be a smart professional person, <laughs> which I am. Yep. But I wasn't getting to do the work I wanted to do. I like to help people break out of vanilla. That's what was bugging me about my old life. It was just good on paper. And I couldn't be my freak flaggy self. And now I have this business where I can say whatever the fuck I want. I you know, I, do want to. <laughs> I opened up that speech. Um, <laughs> I took some stand-up comedy classes last year, yeah. which was hilarious because I bombed. <laughs> like, I, I, my first performance was a total bomb. I blacked out on stage. But at that talk you're referring to, Creative Mornings, I said, hey, guys, my name's Lauren Widrick, and these introductions are weird, but I'll start with this. What I said was, I drive a minivan in the streets, and I'm a freak in the sheets. <laughs> and that was the first thing I said, and the whole crowd was like, what? But I knew that they would be like, this isn't your typical speaker. Yeah. Right? And I knew it would compel and repel. So, like... A good amount of people in the room would be like, oh, shit, she's cool. And another group of people would be like, no, she is not for me. But they're still listening to you, though, because you got maybe, their, their attention. Yeah, no, I, I teach in my business coaching a concept of magnetic marketing. So think about a magnet. If you put two, like, positive, negative charge, they will attract each other. But if you put um, a positive and a positive, they'll repel each other. So you have to decide if you are willing to repel the people that aren't your people to be your fully expressed self. Yeah, we'll talk about that with I guess like my, my brain can be like that sometimes too. Yeah. You love me or hate me. And that's kind of, uh -huh. that, and that's okay with me for sure. Um, so you're an entrepreneur, I'm an entrepreneur. And I think a lot of people want to be entrepreneurs. Yeah. Um, I, I think you're part of what you do, you do well from what I can see is you try to get people off their ass, try to motivate people to make that change the way that you did. But how do you get, you know, 
a, a mother who's working a nine to five who has a great idea or somebody who's been in your shoes at the bank or a corporation, how do you make them make that change? Even though they, they probably might want to, but they don't know how to do it. But is it possible, you know, can, can people change? Like how hard is it to get people to do that? You can't make somebody want something they don't desperately want. So it has to start with them really wanting it. But where most people are is like, I work at the bank. I'm a busy mom. I feel like I'm on a hamster wheel. I want to start my own business, but I can't because I don't have time. I don't have the money. My husband doesn't support me. It'll never work, right? My job is to see if those barriers can be broken down for that person. And 99 times out of 100, they can be. Because those were my fears too, right? I made great money in investment banking. I'm like, how the hell am I going to match this income as a life coach? I've never started my own business. I've never sold anything, right? I was a corporate employee with a bonus. Yep. So if you can work with that person and be like, okay, what's really holding you back? Is it an invented fear or an actual skills gap? An invented fear we can work with. Those, those were my issues. A skills gap, you don't know how to start a business. Okay, I have a course for you. It's called Slay Your Side Hustle. Got the business startup checklist. It's got sales scripts. It's got all the a marketing plan. It's got everything you need to start your business. No longer an excuse. Okay, what's next? Your husband doesn't support you. Really? Does he really not? Or have you not come to him with like an actual plan that you're excited about? It's hard to support somebody who's a entrepreneur who's like, I might, I might do this someday. I might not. I don't know. I hate my job. I'd like to quit, but I'm not doing anything. Of course, of course your spouse doesn't get it. But when you come to this person, you're like, this shit is on. Look, I have a plan. I have a coach. Concept of cash flow in 90 days, this is possible. So it's all about breaking down the blockers, the impediments to what you want. And, and excuses. Well, and excuses. Excuse, other excuses. And excuses. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, the life you have versus the life you desire. <clears throat> you said that on your Creative Morning Stock. And that kind of resonated really well with me. And um, it kind of resonated to what I try to tell my employees, especially my, my LOs. And the, the point is, is that the last year or so in the mortgage industry, have been really more real estate in general. And, and that's just part of the ebb and flow of really any industry. Yep. Um, it's a cleansing, you know, a lot of people get out, but our people all stayed. But I think, um, you know, what would you tell a loan officer or somebody in the industry like ours that's been going through this about, you know, how do you keep, keep going um, when you might think about throwing in the tower, you might think about giving up, even though you know at the end of the, at the, end of the, the road, there's a, there's, there's a lot of gold there, basically. But some people just want to give up and quit. Like, what do you tell that person? Yeah, it's astounding that all of your people stayed. That's a testament to the company. Uh, this is a cleansing time. So during these volatile markets, you know, the winners rise to the top and the herd is thinned. Wouldn't you agree? 100%. So I gave a talk to a residential real estate company here in town, and they had the same thing. They were like, this is crazy. People aren't wanting to buy interest rates. Like, it, it's hard to find buyers. They're nervous. And I'm like, 80% of agents, I feel like, are going to be weeded out over the next 12 months. And guess who the spoils will be left for? You. So are you in this for the next 12 months, or are you in this for the next 12 years? Because the choices you make now will impact how you experience your business and your life 12 months from now. And I think about my business, like how many freaking twists and turns. There were, there were three-month periods, six-month periods where I thought the whole thing was going to fall apart, right? And if I would have quit at that point, I wouldn't be sitting here with you right now. So failure is inevitable. It's part of the process. When you have big goals, when you're reaching beyond where you've ever been before, you're going to fail because you've never done it before. If you want to be a badass loan officer, You've got to learn how to survive these periods because the real estate market is not like <laughs> linear. It's not the same all the time. At all. So if you can get through this boot camp, if you can survive this period right now, you not only will still be here, you'll be among the best, the top 5% of loan officers because next time this happens, you'll have a playbook to deal with it. You'll have the resilience. I don't know. It's just a badass versus a sad ass mentality yeah. as I like to no, say. I mean, 100%. I mean, you can come in every single day and look at the market and complain and whine and bitch and moan. But the reality of the situation is, you know, everybody who stayed at our company, which is basically every, everybody we had, is better because of it. And they know how to sell in a different market. They know how to save money when they're not making as much money as they were in the past. And I think the people who can stick with it are going to make a lot of money. It's just getting them to get them there. You, you, I always say, the party is going to happen. You just got to be there when it starts, you know? And I think that's, yeah. I think that's been a tough part for, for a lot of people. And it's um, a message I've tried to get across. And I think I love the way you say that for sure. Let me see if this translates to what you guys do. Because I said this to the, the real estate agents. I said, you know what? There may be an opportunity for you 
to get into a market of people that are less rate sensitive, the luxury buyers, the investors. Like investors are not going on hold, right? They're making different decisions, but they're not like, oh, I'm just gonna not invest in real estate until the rates correct. The rates aren't gonna like fully correct to 2% like they were in COVID, yeah. right? So maybe you've been working with first time home buyers and your average home sale is 300,000. Go get into the million dollar, pl- like go. Go get in there. Those people are still buying. They're not as sensitive. And you may transform your business. Try, try something different. And that's that's the thing. Yeah. You, you have to experiment. I think I said the other day to somebody, it, it, if you're doing the same thing today, for those on LinkedIn, I said, if you're doing the same thing today as you were a year ago, a year ago, you have missed out on the biggest opportunity of your lifetime. Because this was the perfect opportunity to change your model, change the way you sell, who you market to, how you market to, what you do on social I think the great LOs and really the great agents or anybody uses those times to not whine, but to grow their business to become. Yeah. One of my highest revenue years was 2020. And it shouldn't have been, right? People were getting laid off and furloughed. And, uh, but what I had to sell was of service to the market. It was, Hey, maybe this is a good time to start your own business. And people did tons of people. Yeah. So let's talk about real estate a little bit, because obviously it's through the lens. We're talking about real estate. I, I know that you know a lot about it. I know that you and your husband invest some. I know that you talk with real estate agents, and you tend to have a good good thumb on your pulse there. So um, in your opinion, um, what's the most compelling reason, like when you talk to your squad, like people should invest in real estate, and how do you intertwine that with some of the entrepreneurial coaching that you do? Yeah, it's, um, it's wealth building. Certainly, instead of having, you know, you can start your business and you can make sales and have revenue. That's just your income. That's money in, money out. But unless you invest those dollars that you make in your business, you're not going to actually build wealth. You're just going to keep, you know, you've bought yourself a job by starting your business. So in my coaching, I ask people, all y'all say you want financial freedom. But what does that even mean? What does that mean? That means different things to different people. So some people, financial freedom is the ability to work from anywhere. Okay, so you've got like an online business where you sell courses and you're not tied to an office. Uh, for some, financial freedom is work optional. Like you've got $3 million in the bank or in assets, you never have to work again. For some, it's literally just having an extra couple thousand dollars a month so you can do what you want. Yeah. Right? You don't have to quit your job or start a business or become a digital nomad. You don't have to do any one thing, but you have to know what financial freedom means to you. And so the reason my husband and I are very into real estate because he eventually, he still works a corporate job. He's a commercial lender. Um, so eventually we'd like to get him out of that so that our portfolio can cover off his salary. In my business, I need to build up the passive income arm. A lot of what I do is, is me <laughs> delivering things. Yeah. So if I can get the passive income arm up, I can be work optional. Like if my online courses or whatever are covering my living expenses, then I don't have to do shit. So what's the financial freedom to you is, is what? It's only working when I want to, not because I have to. Gotcha. Yep. Yep. And so for a lot of people, it's, oh, I need this huge real estate portfolio. And we're doing that too. But I will feel free when I create an online course. Everybody's buying it in the background. And then I'm like, okay, what do I want to do today? I want to go speak on stage. Or I want to, you know, publish a book. I don't have to worry about whether or not those pay me because I'm getting paid. Yeah. And when you do that work that you actually want to do, that's when you actually get paid the most. That's right. That's right. When you enjoy what you do. Yeah. So- yeah, failure's part of the journey. You know that I've I failed a ton of times. I, I read something the other day kind of resonated with me. It said if you're not embarrassed <laughs> about what you did two years ago, you're you're not growing, or you're not trying, or you're not taking chances, which are all important. So um, tell me about maybe some of the things you failed at. Um, maybe some I know I know you have the comedy skit that you think basically had a panic attack on, from what yes. I could tell. But maybe some other things business wise, um, or how you failed or failed quickly, whatever it may be, and like maybe like some, some growth stories about that. Yeah, I have a whole episode of my own podcast called The Failure Chronicles, all the things I fucked up in my business. And I love being a business coach and a life coach, but it's not because I have the perfect package or solution for you. It's because I screwed this stuff up and I continue to screw it up. So for instance, when I started my business as a side hustle, I intended to be out in six months. I started signing clients. I'm like, shit, we're making money here. I will quit my job in six months. It took two and a half years. Yeah. Because I wasn't smart with my money. I had a baby, in the, a surprise baby in the middle of it. So there's that. That's help. Yep. But I didn't have the urgency. Like, I was kind of just limping along. I wasn't being true to myself. So, you know, I missed that goal by, I don't know, 5X, right? 5X failure. I have failed on stage. I, in 2021, you know, after having that big 
year in 2020, I just told you about, I was cash heavy at all this, you know, I had a six figures of cash sitting in my bank account. So I'm like, time to scale, time to hire. So I hired all these people, turned on all these online funnels, was building my company. And the one thing I forgot to do was sell. Yeah. So I look up that summer and I'm like, oh God, I've spent all my money and there's not money coming. Right? <laughs> mm-hmm. And so I tried to recover. But again, I had a little bit of that failure feeling that I had when I got fired from my job. I'm like, I spread myself too thin. I didn't focus on the things that mattered, which was revenue. And oh God, I'm a loser. So I had a little bit of like a, another mental breakdown and had to recover in 2022. Gotcha. And you did. I did. Yeah. It was an expensive lesson. I think um, I have a story similar. So in 19, I had a great idea to start a, a, more, a real estate company. And I still think it's a good idea. Um, I, got, I probably spent $100,000 launching it, had a brand, had employees. And I miscalculated something too is that it's really hard to find real estate agents mm. you know that want to leave and work at a startup and i shut the company out in two months and i mean hindsight like man was that just a really really bad idea and i think the less i learned from was if something wasn't working shut it down quickly um and in hindsight i'm a little i, I get a little embarrassed about it because I, I i got a bunch of my employees to get licensed i had this grand idea and it was um a complete loss i mean i love whatever every dollar I put it i basically lost um, but there's a learning experience in it, and that, that was probably like my most embarrassing like startup company story. You know what though? Like all of the people that I look up to, I listen to their podcasts. These you know serial entrepreneurs. Every single one of them hit it big on their like fifth company. Yeah, yeah. It's rarely do you have a home run the first time around. Yeah, I don't think so. And the fact that you shut it down quickly, there are so many people that throw good money after bad because of pride or stubbornness or whatever, like, oh man, I've got a hundred G's into this. I better, like, let's stick it out for a year. Was it the law, like the law of sunk cost, like quit digging? Yeah. The kind of concept? Yeah, the sunk cost fallacy. Well, how much different, like what's the main difference? So if you think you've been seven years now, yeah. what would you say the main character differences you have or the main differences today versus the day you started, how you either manage or grow or sell? Because I think about when I first started my first company, like I, that's not the same guy. Like I couldn't run my company a day with, with the skills that I had in 2007. So like maybe they two or three things that are so different for you today than we're seven. Well, the big thing is embracing sales. So when I first got certified as a life coach, I was like, doopy doop, I'm awesome at life coaching. Okay. So everyone needs to hire me. So I put up a website. No, but I, wait. So, then it just come, right? So I had to learn the skill of pipeline building, networking, brand building, all of that stuff. But like I mentioned before, the first couple of years, I was kind of a fake ass bitch, to be honest with you. Like I was out there, my website said that I was um, a world-class executive coach here to optimize your greatest asset, which is your human talent or so- something very corporate speaky, very cliche, very black and <laughs> black and white website. Like, and I had a really hard time getting clients and I didn't really enjoy that work. And it wasn't you. And it wasn't me. So I could go into these companies in my business suit and teach people productivity or whatever, but it didn't fire people up. So it's hard to admit sometimes, like, I feel like I'm a smart person, but that's not my number one skill. It's the light, lighting the fire under the acids. And I had insecurities about that. I'm like, is that a real skill? Will people pay for that? And they, they do. They will. They, they will. will. Sure. And people need it. I need it. I mean, I've had a coach continuously for seven years. There are times when I look in the mirror and I'm like, I don't feel like doing this today. And my coach will come on and be like, sad ass or badass? Who are you going to be? What, what do you want six months from now you to be saying about today? Yeah, that's right. Right? This is the life you want. You, you want to be work optional. You want to be wealthy. You want to be traveling. You want to hand down a business to your kids. Like, get off the couch and go. You still work with Sarah? No, but we're close friends and yeah. colleagues now. We partner on a lot of things. She, 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 she's awesome. I, I think we're going to get close to in here. So what advice um, would you give, you know, Somebody in real estate right now who is looking to grow their business, they're, they're kind of towards the beginning, they're looking five or six years ahead. Like, what advice would you give that guy, girl, whoever it may be, about growing their business, marketing, branding? Like, where would you tell them to start if they want to go? It's highly personal. So I have a process that I teach called Grab Life by the Goals. It's a method. The very first thing we do is called the Life Vision Lab. And what do you want out of life? Do you want a real estate empire or do you want a simple life in an RV where you can travel? Like what you want out of life will dictate your business decisions. It's so easy to go into a podcast or a book and follow that guy's playbook, but it might lead you down a path that you don't like, doesn't fit your blueprint, doesn't get you where you want to be. 
So definitely start by creating a vision for your life five to 10 years from now so that you can decide what actions you can take to move you toward it. One of those questions includes your definition of financial freedom. Is it simply more income? Is it work optional? Is it passive income? Is it investments? Is it something else? Knowing that will also dictate your actions. Now, if all of that leads you to starting your own business, I would have you look at the intersection of what you love to do, what you're good at, and what's needed in the market. Okay? And then before you even start your business, go do a quick round of market validation. Go talk to 10 people. This serves two purposes. One is like, if you're not willing to go talk to 10 people about your business idea, don't bother because you're not going to be good at sales. <laughs> you have to learn to talk to people and socialize your idea. And then the second is, is your idea a good idea? Is it needed in the market? Does it need a little bit of refinement? So many people come up with a business idea and go in a corner and spend $5,000 on a website and they launch this thing to crickets because they don't know how to explain it. They don't know if there's demand, right? And they don't know if they're good at talking to people about yeah. it. So I call this messy action. So many folks want to go into a room for three months and make their business plan. I'm like, no, make your business plan in a day or two and go get started getting feedback, getting potential clients, getting letters of intent. Like start the flywheel before you think you're ready because otherwise you're going to be sitting in the room planning for another year. So I always say forget planning, get a prototype and get it out there and get people hands on. Get started. Uh, So just get started. Get started. Yeah. What's your fail? Could you think of one um, saying or mantra or, you know, whatever, like, what's the one thing that resonates the most to you? For me, I think a couple of things I think of are, um, you know, easy decisions, tough life, tough decisions, easy life is one of them. And I also always think about what is like the power, um, the fear of wrong decision is way worse than the terror of indecision. It's not like that. Absolutely. Um, those are two that I think of. Like, well, what's one that you, that resonates well with you? I've got so many. Um, I just published my first journal on Amazon, and so they're filled with these quotes, like motivation is garbage and whatnot. You know what I just tell people? Quit dicking around. Yeah. That's it. I say I have a little flow chart in my, some of my materials, and they say, do you know what you want out of life, yes or no? If you know what you want out of life, then quit dicking around and go do it. Do it. If you don't know what you want out of life, then start with a happiness sprint. Like spend three months figuring out what makes you happy. If you're really lost, if you're like, should I get a new job or do an investment or – if you really don't know, go focus on your happiness and the answers will reveal themselves. Well, that's all I got. Um, Lauren, can you give us your handles on uh, social so people can follow you after they listen to this? Yes, I'm most active on Instagram. So my handle is at Lauren Widrick, just my name. Um, I'm also on LinkedIn at Lauren Widrick and my website is laurenwidrick.com. I appreciate you stopping in. It's so fun. Right, Thank bye. you.